everyone. Hello. 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 Welcome to season three, episode eight of Inside the Rookery, in which we are gathering to talk about embellishing your RPGs. You will note that episode eight has proven to be an ill-omened number, and Andy Law is not with us today as he has been struck down by a mystery disease known as labyrinthitis. See, I, I thought labyrinthitis was where you were compelled to wear revealingly tight trousers and kidnap babies. No. He's not doing that, is he? He is not doing that. Okay. I am happy to report. He is very, very dizzy. Well, in fact, right now he's asleep. But earlier on, he was dizzy and nauseous. It's really oh, no. horrible. Oh, and no. So I have banished no. him. Well, I've just not bothered to wake him up. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sure if there were any questions you specifically wanted to ask him, he will, as always, be available on our Discord and we'll be able to answer them there. Little plug for Discord. Get yeah, well soon, Andy. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I will pass that on to him. Yeah. So today we're talking about embellishing your RPGs. And as mm. always, we've got pre-submitted questions from patrons and friends on our Discord server. And we have people in the chat. Seagoat rightly observes that Lindsay is in a big chair tonight again. I am indeed. Um, and we will be bringing up the comments as mm. always <laughs> as we go along. And there seem to be some people in the comments who are trying to make me laugh. Embellishing your RPGs, like covering your books with glitter or other sparkly gems. <laughs> Righty seems streams and have replies. We are not vajazzling your books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not we're not talking about that. Yeah. Um, right. So um, I will get into a question from Martin. Right into what is your must-have non-digital tech-based accessory for RPGs? Hmm. Um, I will I will come with a, a pre-submitted answer because Andy and I discussed this in the week. <laughs> it's like two for the price of one. And that is our glass table, hex-covered glass table, which is amazing. It is non-digital, but it's still some kind of technology. Um, and it is great <laughs> for, well, it is, strictly speaking. Oh, glass. glass. <laughs> it is glass and it has hexes on it. And it is extremely handy for... Um, curtailing Andy's perfectionism and allowing him to do quick maps rather than maps he takes days on all through the week in the prep for a session. And also, um, yeah, just on the off the cuff, sketching out extra maps if we come into a situation he didn't expect and he wants to um, let us um, see what's in his mind. Especially useful for me because my spatial awareness is questionable at best. Yeah, so I mean, I think... I I, I think that sort of more generally links to, to for me, like if if there's an important tactical combat, right, which whether that's a dungeon based thing or or not, um, if it's one where actually you have to be concerned about your positioning, then then yeah, some kind of map or floor plan is is vital for me. As as we've mentioned on the stream before, I have this thing called aphantasia, so I don't have much of a visual imagination. So it's very easy for me to like miss a detail and like perhaps not realize that there's a whole door and corridor there and I'm suddenly I'm being attacked from the side. I'm like, where, where did, how did that happen? Whereas if I can at least see the, the map, um, then I, I kind of know that. And I don't even necessarily need to have it there for the whole thing, but I need to have seen it in order for me to like properly um, kind of visualize right. it. So yeah, it's a big one for me. Yeah, I, I'd say the same. Some form of mapping, I generally as a GM... Uh, pure theatre of the mind, but when you get those tactical situations, you need to know where everybody is. Um, and I've used uh, miniatures, uh, I've used dice to represent people, paper counters that we've just kind of torn off a pad in the heat of the moment. Um, but my favourite, and if anybody's listening who or watching who's uh, been in one of my college games especially, was uh, I had a red plastic chicken from a, a toy shop barnyard animal set. And uh, whenever I didn't have the right miniature for a particular monster, this would come out. And it became, out the yeah, it became legendary. The, the cry of not the red plastic chicken. Uh, at least the battle chicken. <laughs> yes. Uh, for me, I, I would say miniatures has always been the thing that I've always, uh, because I, I was a, I'm a miniature painter, so I always want to have, mm. you know, a, a selection of, of, of little miniatures. Even, and even as a player, even if I'm not, um, even if uh, we're not in a miniatures 
a, a, a essential situation. I still want my little guy sat in front of me and my at my place at the table, you know, with my dice, my dice and my guy. So, um, so you would have a little, whether you were using minis in the game or not, or the GM was using them on the players, you would want to have a mini for your character to represent yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah, yes. I don't know what that's about, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so Caravan had said in the chat in the week, Pathfinder pawns, save minis for the stuff you and your players care about and use pawns for a variety of adversaries. Yeah. Easier to carry in token boxes if you're traveling or have a small space to game in. I had a small space to put these banners in. So some have been edited for, um, what's the word? Shortness. Like no, brevity. 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 There you are. <laughs> Um, and Seagull, just while we're on the subject of maps, use slash want maps, not just glorious detailed and annotated maps for GM, but blank maps for the players, rough hand drawn maps for the players, so it looks like someone sketched it real quick. Hmm. Yeah, I would. When I was GMing, I, I would kind of give the, the players a, 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 a graph paper, sometimes graph paper, sometimes hmm. blank paper, and I'd describe the dungeons as we're going through it. I mean, I, I think back on it now, like what a massive amount of time was wasted. As they as they sketched out the dimensions yeah, of the room before I told them what was in it, yeah, you know, it's, it's it was not it was, yeah. it was sort of un, un, unconvincing. Whereas you would you would you would sketch out the the room after you'd fought whatever monster was in it, you know. Yeah, I would like to draw it out in advance. It seemed like wrong headed now. Yeah, well, it's it's the sort of uh, the narrative reality versus the tactical necessity, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. Uh, speaking of measuring rooms, in one of the college campaigns I played in, the GM created a demon lord whose name was, what are the dimensions of the room again? <laughs> Who was summoned by the sound of his name. <laughs> uh. the, the glass table was useful for that because Andy would often have like the master map. Um, sitting with him and he would sketch it out on the table as we went along like this unrolling fog of war which was quite handy Mark because then we all didn't have to like do that individually badly in our little jotters mm. we could just watch I, it unfold yeah, on the table. I, I mean I, the, 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 I know we talked about in the non-tech versions but the high-tech versions now where you get the the LCD table where the dungeon sort of you know is, is, is digital and it unfolds as you go along that, that's that's kind of amazing yeah, um, well, uh, you know, yeah, be holographic. Chandra has asked, What's your opinion on using virtual oh. tabletops at a physical table? And I, I think, in the early when we before you really could get virtual tabletops, we used to have a map on the on the TV, it must have been a PS3, so that tells you about yeah. how long ago it was. And and it was zoomed in, and as we went round, I think we were on some kind of rescue mission to the rock or something like that. Was it the rock that we, the Dark Angels one? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were going ever deeper into the rock. Um, and 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 it would just because it was zoomed in, you could only see the bit you were on, and Andy just moved the zoom around to, and that, that worked quite well. And although I seem to remember because the trigger buttons were what was used for moving it, so I seem to remember there were issues where you would put the controller down, yeah. and it would suddenly <laughs> rotate and zoom out again. You'd be like, oh, God. yeah, <laughs> and it all zoom back in again, and it rotates again. Mm. I think I think it's interesting the idea of virtual um, tabletops. Obviously, using the screens and things. One of the things I'd wondered about was using um, a projector because nowadays you can get really good HD projectors that are bright enough that they will work even in a, a well lit room. And I did wonder about whether hanging a projector would oh. actually be cheaper than buying a, an LCD table, so you just project it down. Um, but I, I, I haven't. Idea. I haven't tried it, but I, I suspect yeah. that would be cheaper and potentially easier as long as you've got something to hang it from. But, mm. You'd yeah, have to watch yeah. for obstructions, though, mm. like people moving their minis. And yeah. Stuff. yeah. Well, that, I mean, that could also be quite dramatic. <laughs> like, da, it da, could. Da, da, da. Yeah. There's a high in shadow. I'm just gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna do that yeah. for a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's like the augmented reality is a big thing now, isn't it? People, yeah. people are starting to do that too, which is mm. a, a whole another dimension. So Will Spain said we had a running standard size that whenever a player asked how big something was, it would always be as big as this room. That <laughs> sounds familiar. I've heard yeah. that a lot of times. Yeah, but or half the size yeah. of this room or twice the size of this room. Yeah, That's yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah. Or the size of Wales. That's another standard. The size of Wales? What well, the country <laughs> the, are they? Or the, or the, the country. The country. Oh. It's like the size of three Wales, the size of half a Wales. Like everyone would know how big Wales was. It's, right. it's used quite often in like, I don't know, news articles. Hmm. Oh yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, mm. that's what my country has become. Less... That's what my country has become. 
Thanks for the English, I'm sure it's their fault. Yeah, but stand it's stand the 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 eye, isn't it? Yeah, it's the thought... yardstick by which all other countries are measured. That's a good thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. I should yeah. look at it in a positive way. It's the yeah. Wales standard. That's the... Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm presuming that'll be part of imperial measurements if they come back. They'll have to... So, so the, the, <laughs> the centre of the room is, is entirely uninhabitable then by that by that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so um, Martin asks, or says, is it, uh, yeah, it's an ask. I find mind maps are an essential accessory for me, but I wonder why modules don't make more use of relationship maps. I um, think because most writers haven't figured out how to do them. It's something I've sort of half looked into and then something else came up and I never actually got round to it. Um, but with Vampire the, the Masquerade used to have really good ones. So you, wow. in, in their cities, they would have their coterie maps, they would have their politics maps for areas, for types of politics, and it was really good because you could see kind of the overlap. And we used them a lot. We used the ones in the books that were pre-provided, but then we made our own, like, based on the same principle. Right. They, they were really, really handy, like blood bond links and, and that kind of thing. But the downside of them is they were really ugly and they take up a lot of space in a book. Mm. So I, yeah. I was talking again. I was talking to Andy about this, and he said that they had relationship maps planned for um, the Uber Strike book, the starter mm. set, and they just took up too much space yeah. in yeah. in a book that was already tight for space. And they're really quite hard to make yeah. to look. I, like I, I, I had a very rough one that I'd kind of done to keep it right in my head as as I was writing it, but. At the end, we're like, there's, there's nothing, there's no practical way we can make yeah. this look attractive or, or fit inside. I mean, we already had asked to kind of expand the book like twice mm. over what it was, it was significantly larger than it was originally meant to be. Um, and yeah, there was nothing in it we'd want to cut out for that. I think as well, like it, it, it very much depends on the type of game. Like, I think they're really useful in a game that is all about those kind of interpersonal politics and relationships and there's that faction and that faction and that faction and yeah. and not all games are like that yeah. um and even in a game that is like that it's not often always like that so you might yeah. have a few sessions that are like that but then you're on to something else so it was a lot of time and effort and space for for something quite large yeah. um Whereas for Vampire, it's all about that, right? It's all about the politics. Right. It's all about the relationships. Yeah. So you see that would work. I mean, I do wonder whether it's something that um, that could be done as like a digital extra, I suppose. So something you don't print, but you could do as a, a PDF and it doesn't matter if mm. it's if it's lopsided. Because, you know, it, 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 whenever it's one of the issues, like planning and, and doing maps and things like that is something I do a lot live like when I'm teaching, when we're looking mm. at how we plan essays and, and lines of argument and stuff like that. Um, and you know there is nothing more imbalanced or uneven than a mind map that you make on the fly without really thinking about what <laughs> right. you're going to say before you, before you start it. And you, yeah. you know you start in what you think is the middle, and then you end up and it's massively lopsided. Um, I yeah. will say, like digi digital technology makes that a lot easier if you're whether it's OneNote or or you know some kind of like infinite whiteboard yeah. digital space that you're using. It allows you to keep scrolling and expanding the, the way that you want, and then you can kind of end up with with something. Right. But, yeah, but you're right, though. They're really hard to make good looking. I remember when we were doing the first edition of Power Behind the Throne, we needed a relationship map in there because the politics was the heart yeah. of the whole adventure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the uh, the handout that's in the book looks absolutely horrible. I can't remember now if, uh, if an equivalent was done for uh, the director's cut version, but I imagine it would have been needed. Yeah, I find them very appealing as an idea, but in practice, mm. just, yeah. Yeah. And for layout, Mark, I, I just think that they're kind of like a, a blocky chunk that then has to sit mm. in the book, and it's quite hard to make them fit in with the setting. Like, would you have an in-character relationship map? Like, I mean, you yeah. might, like, yeah. Mm. but, yeah. yeah. That, that would be one of the only ways, I think, to make it, like, mm. visually arresting. Um, Challenge yeah. accepted. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, the way my mind works, I, I find them a little hard to read. I have to kind of stop and puzzle out what all the arrows mean. So they, I find them not terribly efficient, but obviously they work better for Martin. And, if, uh, if, yeah, uh, talking about them in character, if you had like a Machiavellian sort of character in the game, you could imagine they would have drawn out all these sort of relationships with no yeah. stuff. And that might be something interesting to look at and 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 practical but yeah 
Yeah, we actually had one, Andy, if you remember, in our epic Warhammer campaign, which was the thing that we found on that old Temple of Verena ceiling, yeah. and it was a relationship map, and it purported to show something to do with the relationships between the gods, and we spent like literally months trying to work out what the actual relationship was, and, and then it turned out afterwards, after it was entirely useless to us because you know, the world had practically ended by then, that it was a, a literal map of how, how the domains connected to each other so each god sort of like had a, a domain or a realm and those were the the way that you could get to one through others and we found out later so it was literally both a godly relationship map and a physical map to guide us through the world which we completely failed to use as is our group's work. I mean in our defense that would have required quite a cognitive leap for us to figure that out. <laughs> it, would, it would have yeah. it would have to be fair. Um right so, uh, did we have this one? What's your favorite RPG accessory? I think we did. Mm, no, no, not in no. general. No. Nope. Then let's do this one let's, now. Let's do it. Right. Well, I, I'm going to pick up something Mark <laughs> touched on, which, which was the miniatures thing. And I, although I'm mm. trying to get back into it, I've got some unpainted guardian sitting on the shelf behind me. Um, like I don't, I, I don't have as much time as I used to, but, mm. but when I was younger, miniatures w were very much the thing. And and again, like like having the one for my character, I remember um, my, my Grey Magister character, Adamar, um, the first miniature that I had for him. And it was at a point when like there wasn't a lot of of miniatures available that, that actually fit what I wanted him to, to look like. So mm. I ended up using, I think it was an elf um, archer that sort of has its cloak around it. Um, and I kind of cut the bow out and turned that and replaced it with a staff and stuff like that. So it ended up being this kind of like sh shattered kind of mm. gray, gray magister, which was very good. But um, but I went even further, and this, this is absolutely my favorite thing. Back This is when Andy and I still worked for Games Workshop. In fact, it would have been the point when we were sharing a house with Lindsay as well. Um, and we were running through another iteration of the enemy within at the time. And my character ended up founding a regiment of handgunners. Um, and for various sort of story-based like that. reasons, that, that's it. Um, my uh, my character was wearing a green cloak because he had totally failed to pick up on the significance of what green cloaks are in the Empire. Um, and so he ended up having this whole regiment of handgunners that all kind of wore green cloaks. And I thought it was quite a cool little detail because they could use it to kind of, you know, shelter themselves when they're reloading and stuff like that. So I converted an, an entire unit of Empire handgunners to all have these kind of like green cloaks um, on the back of them. And then I built an entire empire army just to justify having this wow. unit of, of handgunners that I had. So I ended up changing the army that I played in the store and all that kind of stuff. And I actually did it twice. I, I did two for the first time I did like literally in the shop and the only separate cloak that I could get um, was a kind of a, a metal one. Um, mm -hmm. And so they were identical and they were really, really, you know, kind of stay and they didn't work. And then a few years later, they brought out the Chaos Marauders ones and they had some more interesting cloaks that were more flexible. Yeah. Um, so I kind of was able to do some more and the new plastic handgunners were better. So I had a, a second yeah. iteration and they are, I believe, in a carrying case somewhere in the law's house still wow. to this day. Yeah, probably, uh, probably in the garage. Wow. Um, but yeah. see, got said back in the day, getting appropriate minis for your character were limited, and they were, they were even more limited if, like me, I do play men sometimes, but by and large, I tend to play women in the games that I play. And that was even harder to find, mm. and I relied on Andy a lot to, like, my Andy, to to convert things, and and then I remember, oh, I can't remember what they're called, the the. the the, the girls in the galaxy ones um and they've got like loads of beautiful ones but but the revelation was and i changed my army too andy if you remember i started to play dark elves because um the dream my character was imprisoned by dark elves for a spell what could be nicer and and then eventually got like some sort of magic ring that allowed her to like appear as a dark elf so she could kind of like get out and and, and go about in the world um and i completely changed my army to dark elves because and there were much more um female options as long mm. as you wanted them not to be wearing anything right <laughs> them are the rules back then <laughs> you win some you lose some yes right but luckily yeah. that character was an ulrican who had a resistance to cold so it didn't work out too badly <laughs> That's so right. the fur bikini yeah. was perfectly fine yeah, yeah perfectly fine yeah because i was yeah. like how is she not going to get frostbite this place is freezing uh-huh <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. The, the villagers' ranges were about uh all you, you could rely on for good role playing characters if you weren't playing a warrior type. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I think when, when, when I, in, when my, when my group, I, I think I tended to gather most of the miniatures my, myself because I was, it was, I think of, of my D and D group, there was two of us who were sort of committed painters. Mm. Um, so I would, it, people would just take a minute that had something about it that, that resonated with them or felt like, oh, that's appropriate yeah. for my character. Oh, my yeah. character's laughing. Oh, I'll take the short character. I have a dwarf. Oh, you have a dwarf miniature? Okay, that'll be me. And that was sometimes about as, about as much as, as, as we could manage. Yeah. But then that would be your miniature every time we got together, you know. Right. As the paint, as the paint inevitably chipped off and they got more and more worn as the campaign yeah. wore on, you know. And I'd occasionally take them away and touch up the paint and the next week, oh, you've, they've been repainted. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Um, one thing that, no question did come up actually in here, but Orca had a list of things that they um, found useful. So minis, a game table with vertical, and a game table, a table game, a game table with vertical and horizontal TVs for maps, NPC picks, scenes, etc. Weapon, mm. miscell miscellaneous items and other bric-a-brac. It gets weirder, a flag and pendant, <laughs> sensible chairs, themed food, a big wall map, and a parent. <laughs> wow. Seems but, entirely reasonable, all of that. It is, yeah. But um, this one, number three, weapons, miscellaneous items, and other brick about we have a, a, a player who kind of tends to pick, like, one prop, like a pipe or a pouch and, and sort of use that as a signifier for their character and might pick it up when they're speaking in character, put it down when they're not. I wondered if, if the three of you, well, I know that Andy also has that experience because like we literally play in the same group with that guy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> have you had any other experiences like that where it's like a touch of live role play, a touch of costuming to help mm. um, players get into the... I don't recall anything with actual physical props, but uh, there was one GM, um, Steve Hand, actually, creator of Chainsaw Warrior and Fury of Dracula. I, I played in a chill campaign that he ran, and he was very good at um, giving NPCs little mannerisms. There was one who had this really annoying throat clearing thing oh. wherever he spoke. And, you know, he was supposed to be annoying as an NPC, and my goodness he succeeded <laughs> um and yeah a little sort of maybe physical movements and so on so you could you could tell exactly who you were uh, talking to um uh, npc picks as well as olka says is uh something i find very important mm. to convey yeah i mean I've, I've definitely found like like improvising like pretending i've got things so like you know if, I, if i've always yeah. got a pen because I'm, I'm making notes then that pen might might become something like it might become yeah. a pipe or, or you know whatever yeah yeah it, but it, it's more as a point of like to gesticulate to gesture or whatever but yeah. right yeah and and i've done similar and it's sort of something that comes up organically i've never had a particular prop for that purpose yeah. that's interesting i mean i have i have bought a, a kind of a replica mjolnir um for my for my sigmarite priest i don't know uh if i'll ever actually bring it to the game to get a wave around but but i've got it just in case you should just yes. in case yeah yeah uh, i think i mentioned before that that uh, uh we did there's a sherlock holmes uh, uh game that we play and we have a bowler hat because mm. part of uh, for that when you want to yes. speak in Japanese, you put the bowler hat on and, they, and you're therefore you're now your character or a character yeah. nice. um but i i can't think of any other uh props that i've had at the table like a victorian conch shell <laughs> yes <laughs> the talking stick you but you know you yeah. pass it around the group indeed <laughs> yeah yeah I, I haven't really done props that much what do we think uh, this question didn't come up in the comments but i i want to address it and what do you think about players taking notes like sometimes you've got a scholarly character and it's quite in character for you to sit there and like be writing your journal or scribbling down but mm. sometimes you're the kind of player who might want to take notes not looking at anyone in particular um <laughs> and you don't necessarily have a character who particularly i, I, I think yes. though i think you have to be at least a little bit generous on that because mm. yeah you're you know if you're playing like say every week but but sometimes it's not that sometimes it's the longer gaps between it and in yeah. between you've lived a lot of life so to expect you to remember the names yeah, of characters yeah. and, and minutiae, like you need to kind of, but e equally, if somebody's taking the mickey and, you know, slowing the entire table down in order to write yeah. down every word the GM saying, but I don't, I don't think that's commonly no. a problem. 
but no I, I think it's you know it's it's a question of balance as you say Andy and, and also of intent I've had players who've written everything down just in case they might find something they could trip me up on later oh, oh yeah, yeah. God. and uh, yeah um, I would I would make them write with their offhand as well, just to reflect the general level of sort of education and common that's understanding. Nice. I wish you I'd know. thought of that. Handicap that's them nice. with that. See, see how long they want to do that for. Yeah. Or force yeah. them to use an actual quill pen. Yeah. There you go. I do yeah. like I do like the thing I do with my notebooks is I do like them to be like characterful and maybe something similar to what my character might have in game mm. or or just like have something about them that's quite aesthetically pleasing I think for me that's what I like in, in a notebook that I'll take to the table yeah same here. Yeah. and the same with my dice I, I, I don't like just like a random mismatched set of dice personally yeah, I'm I'm the same. New new game, new set of dice. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm 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 the opposite. I still have the dice that I bought in 1977. Oh, wow. And a tribute to how uh well they were made back then, the edges are still sharp. You'd think they'd be spherical by now, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just on the John picks it as the, likes thematic music, and we'll come back to thematic music. But I just wanted to pick up. I've used poker chips to represent money in the past, in-game mm -hmm. card or runes, and I did have to truncate this. So, but I remember what he said. So I'll 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 make up. I have also made puzzles or handouts, and what he was saying here was, for example, giving the players an old key so they physically had it, so they didn't have to write down on their trappings or in their notebook. Oh, we we got an old key from this person because they physically right. had the old key. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. I do. It is one of the things I I do like it when you get a, a handout that is significant. Um, yeah. You know, I th I think like you know some sometimes mm. the, there's like a pressure to make handouts and that actually do, do you really need the handout? Um, it mm. might be a nice characterful thing, but do you need it? But when yeah. you get one where actually you are keeping it for a mm. reason, um, yeah. and then you're like, oh oh, hang on, and you get out the handout and you're like, hang on, we 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 got a letter about that, and you're actually having yeah. to work a thing out like on it. Um, mm. I do, I do like that. Yeah. Just and I remember in, in the end, we were then taking notes on the back of the Adventurers mm. Wanted handout uh, <laughs> at the start. Like, oh, hang on a second, I'm going to. So, literally, it was like the in game thing annotated by my character in game. So. Yeah, I, lo I love all that stuff. Yes, you've got an old yeah. leather bound journal that when a character is, you know, you determine which, yeah. which of your characters is, is, is literate, which one can actually write. And then they're constantly they're sort of scribbling notes as if, you know, chronicling the adventures. I kind of think that feels fun. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've done handouts on things like brown paper that I've distressed to resemble parchment. And yeah. Rolled up into scrolls and, you know, let the nice trick is to roll them up really, really tight and leave them for a few weeks. So that whenever <laughs> the whenever the players try to unroll them to read them, they keep rolling up again. <laughs> You gotta, yeah, they gotta weight it down with something. Yes. Yeah. So Martin asked, "Do you find yourself redoing art maps and yeah. handouts from published modules because they don't quite deliver what you want?" Uh, well, as I just said, when when it's an art uh, sort of uh, handout like Andy was describing that has a, a dramatic value in the game as well and can be made into a prop, then yes. Yeah, or, or if it's a printout, or, or you end up distressing it, you know. Mm. soaking it in tea and all that kind of stuff curling up the edges that's right yeah and i, I guess like size is another thing because obviously when right. you're printing maps and things in, in a book you're very mm. limited into how big that map can you be are. and as a gm you might want it big enough that you can actually move miniatures or counters around on it um yeah. and so if you're going to do that that either involves a lot of photocopying or or redrawing so yeah right yeah, I mean, like the uh, Adventurers Wanted poster you were talking about, Andy. Ideally, that should have been five or six times the size that it was in the book. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, think I think Andy definitely blew it up a bit when he when he gave it for us. But, yeah, yeah, Andy always remakes stuff unless he originally made it himself, and you know, like, and even the sometimes author. then, even <laughs> sometimes then he will make it himself. I'm just yeah. laughing at the idea of tea soap maps and then uh, the party's <laughs> goat just eating the map. Ah, <laughs> uh, the notorious tea sucker. Yeah. <laughs> map sucker yeah oh dear that sounds like an insult from some obscure place doesn't it yeah map sucker oh, oh, he goes sucking the maps again he sucked all the ink off of them like we don't know where we're going 
I mean, that does sound like something a goat would do. (laughs) This this is something that Andy Law would do. We were at a a restaurant in Edinburgh that's kind of like Edinburgh, sort of typical Edinburgh, the witchery. And so it's quite dark and it's on the Royal Mile and it's all cloistered. And and it's quite, they've clearly gone out of their way with like candles and kept the lights really dim and they've had paper menus. And Andy and I (laughs) just burnt the menu by accident. We didn't notice until he was halfway through and it was smoking so yeah yeah he, he doesn't get candles anymore no, <laughs> no candles for you no candles yeah. for you. although yeah. again with the idea of, of, of keeping it like on brand i did i to give a very thorough flashback there to when we were first playing that vampire campaign that ran for a long time and it, again it was in a very dark flat on the royal mile that, that very was dark very period. atmospheric um but in particular we had the role play candle like there were m- multiple candles but there was one massive really thick candle that we used every time it's a church it was... candle the original yeah. one i think was a church candle that was bought bought from G- sir giles cathedral which was like diagonally opposite from that flat and it was yeah. huge and yeah it would yeah. go on the lights would go off and and it was a couple of times we'd start playing and it'd be like no no hang on stop 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 we had to stop until we lit the role play candle and then we were allowed to carry on so. <laughs> yeah and put on yeah. the dracula soundtrack yes the dracula soundtrack. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah. 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 what a couple of yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 yeah i've got it i've got it um uh, like a mix, a, a, a gaming mix, which is just if a gaming night you just put it on and it runs for about six or seven hours. And yeah, the Dracula soundtrack, the Conan soundtrack, obviously Lord yeah. of the Rings stuff too. But it, yeah, it's just just a constant. I mean, low level musical mm. accompaniment just sort yeah. of help, helps to sort of set the tone. I find. Yeah. Do you ever? Has anybody ever used uh, specific music for specific scenes? Because. Um, uh, I was when I was playing Vampire. I, I had a couple of tracks from Dead Can Dance with that sort of wordless singing that they used, and I would often use them when there was a ritual taking place or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, don't, I, don't I, I know Andy we... certainly has if occasionally, not often, but occasionally, mm. if there's been something like climactic happening, mm. you know, he's kind of chosen that. And when we played our Star Wars game. It was good use of like every episode began with he'd done a title scroll, <laughs> so he would play the music and we would, we would read yeah. the title scroll. We would read the title scroll. It was actually amazing. Like yeah, it got you brilliant. so into that game, and yeah. it got yeah. you so especially like for me having I don't know being like five or six the first time I watched Star Wars or yes or six or seven, mm. and and it was always on the TV at Christmas. Like the crawl yeah. just like takes you into that place that place of like magic yeah. and wonder and it's star wars That's and so inspired. having the crawl was just amazing like yeah. so good yeah but it was a crawl about our characters i know <laughs> that's brilliant i love that there brilliant. have been yeah. some warfare games where i've been tempted to break out the benny hill music <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And he totally went out of his way to get the tone just right. Like yeah. so, the tone of the crawl was really like the crawls oh, in, yeah. in the films. Really good. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So background soundscapes. Um, mm-hmm. I think we, we sometimes use them just like, but the problem with them is sometimes they're not long enough. You get an mm. advert in the middle of them, like stuff yeah. can break uh, you out of it. Yeah. Mm. Really. Yeah, so he goes to Pizza Hut in the middle of your Cthulhu adventure. Kind of yeah. I, I vividly remember just mm. like just about kicking myself when one of that happened because it was quite a quiet soundscape and then a very loud advert kicked in. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Not good. Oh, there's, that would be cool. There's a 12 hour Orient Express one. Mm. That yeah, would be really cool. We, we've also talked about using soundscape, like Andy's talked about soundscape or music that determines the time that you have to do something, but you don't know that that determines the time you have to do something. Um, so he's used that to time things. And <laughs> fleshing about the countdown now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting if you, yeah, if you, if you're, if the GM and you've curated a, a soundtrack that increases in the tension and, the, and and it's just playing in the background and you don't tell the players but suddenly things start the music starts to pick up so, and there's this s- sudden building of, of a sort of anxiety the players going oh I suddenly feel happy I, you know what I mean that would be awesome and that's 100 yeah. what the the Bram Stoker's Dracula soundtrack still does to me now I still like it and then Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I can yeah, feel yeah. it. I can feel the the, the tension mm. kind of building up. So yeah, mm. I do wonder whether even just little things like um, and you could add vision in with this, but you know, there's there's like a, a channel where it's just like a roaring log fire, 
that lots mm. of people put on at Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Like that might be quite a nice thing to have on if you're just having a session in the tavern doing your planning. Just you know, again. Yeah. Have you never been yeah. here when Andy's used that? He's done that, but maybe just when we've been doing like interlude chats, maybe and he's. Yeah. I mean, maybe, or, maybe maybe that's maybe, where the, the idea is. Maybe, maybe it's yeah, going to some distant memory, him. but yeah. Um, Seagoat says, I tend not to use music in game in real life. Personally, I find it distracting. I guess it can be. And I tend to switch off music online as I find I miss the GM speech at times. That's, yeah, that's classical music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have a, a, a set, like when we still use CDs, of four CDs that were like just one of those generic like compilation CDs of classical music. But there was like mm -hmm. a passionate one and a calm one and an adventurous one. And, and that was quite good just to like pick one to be the mood for the evening. <laughs> Yeah, soundscape stuff. I can certainly see if you know, if you if you're part of in a in a forest, just having foresty sounds playing in the background would be atmospheric and not distracting. Generally speaking, again, as long as it's not like five minutes on a loop, as long as it's significant. Yeah, time, yeah. That, that would be cool. Yeah, or I I've or as long as it's not like the kind of music you'd get at a yoga class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> just like chimes and yeah yeah war yeah, sounds. Yes, you know you are in a you know in a in a uh, a monastery high in the mountains in which case that's exactly. yeah. which case yes right. crack on yeah um, yeah vagrant finds music distracting as well mm. i would tend to always i i like music i don't find it distracting but i don't mm. really miss it when it's not there mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can adjust the levels personally on, on virtual tabletops because I've never played, but that might be a, a thing there. Yeah. I'm finding, I don't know if it's a trend or if I'm just, my ears are getting old, but on, on television now, I find the incidental music is often so loud I can't hear the characters. Yeah, yeah. Like, doesn't everyone watch TV with subtitles now? Is that <laughs> I guess you have to. Yeah. Like, yeah, but, but my lips get tired. Way. <laughs> what I have noticed with watching with subtitles is all the stuff you get that you actually miss because a, a mm. lot of time now shows subtitle the the kind of the stuff in the background like so they'll subtitle what the, the person's saying on the other end of the phone or they'll mm. subtitle something in the background but my biggest pet hate about subtitles is how say Netflix decides what to call the music because I'm constantly shouting it saying that's not sinister music or that's oh. not melancholy music like yeah there was there was yeah. somebody who was posting something about about sub subtitles and they were talking about stranger things and they mm -hmm. said oh, my favorite subtitle from the new series of stranger things is eldritch thrumming and <laughs> That's the name of a character there, right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or a Jethro Tull album, maybe. <laughs> yes, possibly. Or, uh, yeah. or something you need an ointment for. Yeah. Yeah. Was, there, was there not the one, is it like tent tentacles undulating? Wetly, moistly, moistly, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I do find that usually they, they're just not on point with the music, and so yeah. it just irritates me. Yeah. So yeah, um, Righty Stream says between, says between loud background noise and everything being filmed at night, modern films are poor. Are they filmed at night though, or are they filmed with like considerable amount of lights and then they just like dim it? I That's don't believe possible. they're actually filmed. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I find is is uh, the steady cam shots are anything but steady, and you get a little seasick with it, the thing moving around when you're actually trying to focus on one character. So talk, we just talked a little bit about pet hate. So let's talk about oh, banned yes. things, things that you would ban from games. So mm. um, talk, Susan Hina Yukimi banned accessories, screens with exceptional usage for checking rules and the like, oh, and banned controversial food and drink during play. Mm. That's hardcore. That's yeah. that is hardcore. I think that would split people. Yeah, yeah. I can see. Uh, I can see screens. Um, you know, I certainly uh, try to discourage people from flipping through rule books to see what their odds are of succeeding at something no, unacceptable. You know, yeah, yeah. during play, and the screens are just an extension of that. Yeah, I, I think. Well, you, plus if the you have uh, screens, you kind of have to trust people that they're using them for what you intend to use. Like I have my yeah. character sheet on my iPad now, and All that's right. literally I'll look at that. And occasionally I'll flick over to a rules post to check something because we've got some of the rules online. But that's mm. it. Like, I'll not be, like, going to another tab. I'd be like, oh, I'll just check my Facebook. Right. Yeah, that's that's just rude. Yeah, yeah. But having, like, a static mm. iPad screen with your character sheet on, fine. But oh, yeah. 
like Tell being distracted yeah. by your screens not i yeah. i even i like put mine in just in order to enforce myself i put mine in airplane mode as well oh, so that's that I, clever. I couldn't that's go nice. and check anything else even if i wanted to yeah. literally it's just my yeah just my character sheet yeah. mm. but food and drink banning food and drink like i know mm. uh, there's kind of usually you have tables where the consensus is whether you will drink alcohol or you won't drink alcohol mm. yeah like, are you the kind of party that is quite happy to drink alcohol and maybe some of your choices at the end of the evening become questionable? Yes. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and, yeah. and for some people, that's just like, yeah, because that's part of the experience of role playing. Absolutely. And for some people, it's like, well, I don't, that's not like why I role play. It's not to have mm. that social evening where I have a drink. Right. Yeah. 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 If you're playing with a uh, an LCD table or a LED table, I forget one of the digital, you know, if you're playing on a digital surface, I can see food drink in particular being problematic. Yeah, we, we have had we have had incidents where beer has been tipped over uh, on, a, in, on a game night, uh, uh, you know, onto the cards, which is obviously mm. horrendous. But um, yeah, yeah. And we tend to stop. Oh, we get, oh pizzas are right. We stop. We take a break and then come. Yeah. Back. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was yeah, it. Yeah. You know, yeah. My, my groups, uh, particularly in college, we would take a, a beer break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no sugary drinks near the cloth map is quite right. Oh, no. um, yeah. Chain of 36 once made some real amulets for the intro of a campaign. The front had a symbol on it, and on the back, when they were all put together, would make a map. The oh. players loved it. Well, they That's would love fun. that because it's cool. Yeah. I would love that too. I would love that too. We wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, playing in uni in the pub was always good fun, especially later on in the evening. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If I could remember, I, ha I would have fond memories. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I still keep on coming back to this parrot, though. Yes. Is it, I mean, is, that, is this for a specifically parrot? pirate themed a pirate game? game? Is it an actual parrot, or is it a rubber parrot, or you know, inflatable parrot? Yeah, something? yeah. We need more information on the parrot and the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we do. Theme, theme food is, is always fun. Um, uh, I've got. Oh yeah. A social group here, and we do we do what we call um, family dinners, where we get together, sort of once. Yeah. Started off with. Um, uh, screenings of Game of Thrones would all get together once a week to watch a new episode, and we had and we start the season with a feast where everybody had to bring uh, themed food, mm. uh, and everybody would, would you know would feast and then watch the episode. And my I became um, uh, 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 notorious for my uh, what I call Hoda's balls, which were Scotch eggs. Mm. Oh, lovely! <laughs> Scotch eggs. Speaking, I hadn't encountered before. Right. <laughs> You're going to bring your balls again this week. <laughs> <laughs> did you make them, Mark, or did you find a oh, place no, to buy them? Oh, I, I made them. They were my, my own recipe. There was a, a nice whole grain mustard mixed in with the sausage. Oh, really? Meat. That sounds amazing. It really yeah, does. I'm, cool. I'm, I'm hungry now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we haven't really done themed food. We used to, our regular role-playing day many, many years ago, before the advent of children and, like, lives, when you could, you know, just, like, role-play mm -hmm. for days on end. We'd, like, put it down. Andy would go to work over the road. He'd come back. We'd pick up where we left off after the two Andys had finished a shift at Games Workshop. We would have, like, a Sunday Sunday lunch, like a roast dinner, mm -hmm. um, sort of early afternoon, and then have a, a, a big Sunday gaming session. That was always quite nice. Nice. Um, maybe there is a market for role-playing parrots that we do. Yeah. Know. Yes, we we need to know more. Is is this parrot purely <laughs> decorative? Does it play a role in the game? Is it? Maybe uh... that's how you get around the note-taking issue. The parrot. <laughs> well, the parrot remembers. That's what your character should remember. <laughs> Yeah, I do eat food as long as it's chili or lasagna. I've got a, a friend in New Zealand who currently is sharing semi-regularly on Facebook uh, an extract from the Fool series, Robin Hobbs Fool series, about like a meal that um, that like someone has you know that they've written about and she's made like the the meal that goes along with it. But it, what I learned about those books is that they she talks a lot about food in those books. Mm. So there's like a rich, a rich well to draw from there. Yeah, that's that's almost another subject, isn't it? Fantasy cookery. Fantasy cookery, yeah. So, what RPG extra did you add or use that you thought would work well but didn't? Uh, my very first encounters with D and D, I went to. Uh, oh, I guess it was the games centre on Hanway Street, which was sort of like Diagon Alley, it tucked it away in a side street in London. And they had this dungeon set 
that was uh, sheets of printed card. I mean, like real heavy duty printed card. Um, and you could cut it up and they had little plastic bases and you could make corridors and rooms and stuff. And I thought this is going to be awesome. And I took it along and I set it up and uh, the corridors were so narrow that people couldn't actually reach in to move their miniatures. <laughs> and the uh, the bases were designed such that the um, the floors, the big sections that I used for the room floors, kept tipping. And uh, it was a complete disaster. <laughs> I was, never quite got over the disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember uh, uh, hosting one particular uh, uh Evening, game evening, and I and I bought these um, uh, skull. They were skull candles, mm. and I and I put extra candles in them. And I thought I'm mean, going to be really atmospheric and, and scary. So I had these candles lit around my GM screen, um, and I realised it was too dark for me to actually read <laughs> notes. And this was in the days before I could. I didn't. There was no. There was no cell phone I could turn on and shine the light on my nose. So I ended up put the lights in the room back on and completely ruined the whole atmospheric effect. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a waste of time. Mm. So Martin has also asked, how do you drop a mini game into a session without it derailing the flow as you explain the rules? Oh, that would be a great question for Andy Law if he were here. Well, I, mean, I, think, I think you'll be pleased I, to know that I have, you have got Andy's answer. <laughs> you have? Yes and no. Yes and no. I've done enough. We talked about this before in the mini games, um, one that we did many moons ago. Um, and we have been chatting about this recently. And, and his... His answer, I think, is, well, you don't. You don't drop a mini game into the session that says, right, now we've got this complex mini game that we're suddenly about to go into. You either mm. use one that exists in the game, like the little mini game that's in with um, fourth edition that's like the bribing mini game. It's kind of like a higher or lower thing. Um, mm -hmm. Or what he has done before is used a a mech, like a mechanic that we're all familiar with, like mm. Battle for Armageddon, you know, like the stacks of numbers, and then the table that you compare the two stacks of them, your attack versus the opponent's defense. And it's pretty st standard. Like, and, and he used that, mm. he used that once, explained it to us before. Um, and then from then on, for quite a few, we had the Battle for Altdorf, we had the defense of Calf, I think, Defense of Calf, using a similar mechanic that all the players around the table were quite familiar with. So it was like he had pre-printed all this stuff for us. He'd cut them all out and we got them and then we just set up and, and, and went away. But I think, yeah. or you just explain it before and say, we're yeah. going to have a mini game and don't necessarily what spoil the surprise, but explain it before yeah. or off session. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to weigh up how, how long you're going to be playing that game with the complexity of that game, I think. Yeah. And if it's something that you're only going to spend for 20 minutes in one session, it has to be really simple, like the bribery thing, you know, yeah. something that yeah. just uses the mechanics, you know. If it's something that is going to be a whole session or multiple sessions, well, mm. then it's fine. You just, you stop and explain it. I remember we did, you know, a whole mini game for the, the Hall of Jewels with the wizards in the in the colleges in Altdorf. Um, and that was great. Like, we played through the actual mm. Hall of Jewels. Like, we all of the NPCs were made and all of our PCs were made. And we we did we yeah. did, did the draw and we did all the rounds and we played it through and we were betting mm. so there was a betting yeah well, there was a betting mini on game on the top of, of the mini game. Mini game. Uh, yeah um, it was the yeah. inception of mini games yeah. it was awesome but, yeah. but it was so like we we were all on board with that our characters were in Altdorf for the Hall of Jewels so right that was that was what our session was for for like a few weeks yeah so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think as well as the complexity, there's, uh, it's also worth considering the, the proximity to the, the main mechanics of the rules. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, when I was developing uh, Something Rotten in Kislev way back when, there was a big chase se uh, sequence where you're riding on these skeleton steeds escaping from the dog and horde, and the steeds might fall apart because they're held together by unreliable magic, and the dogans are gaining, or are you gaining? And, and I'm... I, managed to uh tie that in it, it basically became a, a streamlining uh rather than a, a mini game i suppose it was uh, a streamlined version of the full rules that would be used to play that out um, yeah we've we've also done done a, a similar thing where 
I think it was when my character was in Nagaroth and it, and it turned into a bit of a like Mighty Empires hex map, like building up yeah. your house game. But right. for certain key engagements, you then went into a maxi game, which was like Warhammer Fantasy Battle. And we resolved that little battle in Warhammer Fantasy Battle with the army. Nice. And then kind of like went back into the mini maxi yeah. game again. That that was the sort of original vision for for yeah. Warthrop and Warhammer was that they'd be freely interchangeable and you could build up your hero in the role play game and then go and fight on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and Warhammer Quest had a bit of that, like mm. you know, you had the going down the dungeon and then the role play book in between, and you could use it a bit like that to come in and out of. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it keep it simple. Yeah. Explain it beforehand. <laughs> Use something yeah. we already know. Or pick a board game. There's so many board games there. It requires a bit of abstraction, maybe, but you could if you were in a race a, a race chase, you could have like Camel Up, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You're on a stagecoach, you could use that one. What's the one that has the physical stagecoach and you go along oh. it? I've um, seen a I've seen a train one, not a stagecoach. Oh, sorry, yeah, that it is a train one, but yeah. you you can have a stagecoach go alongside it in the expansion. Yeah, yeah Cold, Cold, Cold Express. Express. Yeah, great yeah. game. Yeah. yeah, or There's just to see to see how well if, if people are less comfortable because some people are role playing the social interactions. If you're playing a like really highly political social character, but you don't necessarily mm. want to role play out, you know, the minutiae of a visit to parliament, um, you could use a game like coup, like a bluffing game or something right. to to represent that. Yeah, I have a terrible poker face, so that wouldn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's also the question of course of games in game like tavern games and that sort of thing yeah, yeah. Um, i think they're probably easier because they are in world and the characters can learn them at the same time as the players do but i may be wrong about that what do you think yeah no i, I agree and i think like I, i'm a particular fan of the card game based ones because mm -hmm. you, you can actually get cards and actually play them Right. Um, whereas the, the dice ones where it's like rolling percentages against your tests and stuff, that still feels quite abstracted. I quite like the mm -hmm. idea of a of a, mm -hmm. a pub game that actually uses the normal deck of cards and you're actually playing a little card game and it's a variation of right. you know, yeah. some existing card game, but it's it's an in in game mm -hmm. kind of one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Things like uh Skittles or something is is different if you're just rolling dice. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, if it's a card game, and you, you, again, we're back to the actual physical prop stuff, aren't you? Yeah, oh, you are, these, exactly. These are, these are cards. Yeah. 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 Hmm. So Seagoat says games need to be chance-based, character skill and player skill are not equivalent. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes um, the way we've represented that is that you might have a card game, you might have a dice game that's chance-based. Like, I don't know, think of one like gin rummy right and then but your character has gamble and so andy will allow us like one like peek at his hand or or like something to represent the fact that our mm. character has a little bit of an edge on the other pcs potentially mm. or the other npcs yeah and so it's kind of like a, a mix of a genuinely a chance based playing that card game or that dice game with a little bit of a tweak to the mechanics or you might get like one extra dice to roll and you can swap that in for another dice or something hmm. yeah that that's very much a, a gm decision isn't it it depends yeah. on the group and uh hard to blanket rule that but it's good when it works um yeah we've talked about this so maps to give idea of where players are um but creative fossey i do want to give creative fossey some credit for this i even made some songs for an npc who was going to sing for a noble uh, pc uh, i pre-recorded <laughs> it <laughs> perfect yeah I, I i'm a bit torn about that because at the moment, I've got a character who plays a flute, and I play the flute, but certainly I wouldn't really want to bring that to the table and just start, you know, playing the flute. I, I've been waiting for you to do that. I genuinely have. I've been waiting for when it happens. For the flute to arrive, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my yeah, God. I, I'm because, not because sure Because obviously we have, a, we have another player in the party who... who whose character plays the lute, but I don't think he plays the lute. Uh, <laughs> but... But this might force him to learn. Yeah, really. Shame, shame yeah. It, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Are there any loot teachers about in Edinburgh? Highly well, doubt it. It's our actually, so he's probably able to figure it out. Maybe he could play ukulele, pretend it was a loot. Yeah. There was one in Perth when I lived there. They they also sold violin accessories and my wife plays the, the fiddle a little bit or used to. Um but yeah, it was, it was a, a lootery with a, a oh, really? TH. Yeah. Perth nice Australia. Thing. Perth Scotland. Uh, Perth, Scotland. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know I don't, you ever lived think... at Perth, Scotland. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, briefly. And uh, we got married in Perth and then had to fill out a bunch of paperwork only to be told she couldn't stay because she was foreign. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Presumably in the whole of the UK, not specifically in Perth. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Oh, cool. I mean, it's, again, it's a local place. <laughs> local place for local people. Yeah, no, no. The uh, the missive came from uh, HM government in London, and in it's not, not sort of rule in the, the old rule like they got in Chester, where if you're a Welshman and you're caught within the city walls after dark, they're allowed to shoot you with a longbow. It's not. It's not. Um, not that I think. Nor yet the one I encountered in Durham, where it was illegal to call someone a Scot. There were no Scots in Durham that hadn't been hanged but to call someone a scot was such a deadly insult it constituted breach of the peace wow <laughs> <laughs> wow um, so uh, i just wanted to ask if, if any of you were aware of this so very accurate maps for the gm including measurements and scales and lots of details for example which way the doors open crucial it turns out which oh, way yes. doors open for yeah. your for your party's safety. Found this out a few sessions ago. Um, I like this aspect of Harn maps. Harn was a setting from the uh, the 70s. I never really delved into it, but it seemed to have an infinite number of, of books. It was a huge fantasy world that just kept getting added to. I've not heard of it in years. And, and also Seagoat was saying that um, they like NPC cards, hints and tokens, and, and actually having the NPC you describe as some crazy physical entity, especially if this NPC is a regular. I think all um, parties have their like favourite regular NPCs and their not so yes. favourite regular NPCs. Mm. I wonder how often a, an NPC has to appear to become a regular, though. Hmm. Answers hmm. on a postcard. Yeah, yes. I guess it's almost more about the the player's attitude to the NPC. That's right. Rather than the, the regularity almost. That yeah. The, the like, ones that the even if your characters may hate them, but the players may love them because they love the fact that they hate them. If, right. Yeah. Like, and I think it's Rudy from the starter set. It's like a good example of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And the ones that the GMs try to set up as regulars are usually not the ones with whom the, the players, the characters bond and <laughs> Yeah, and, and then the final question from Martin was about flowcharts to keep track of the adventure, and yet rarely, if oh, ever, do they see inclusion in a finished product. Why do you think this yeah. is? It's the <laughs> same as the relationship maps, right? It's kind of a yeah. bit boring. It, it's kind of that, and also, I think, um, if you've got a flowchart, uh, it makes the thing even more railroady than it inevitably is people think they have to keep to the flow chart mm -hmm. that they're doing something wrong and uh, even if even if they they don't consciously know they're thinking that it, it does influence yeah. them and uh yeah you know an adventure has to be written in a somewhat linear fashion to make sense in a book but that's no indication of how it should be played and and uh, i would not like to put flow charts in for that very same reason and i, I think as well like as an element of prep like like the, the act of making notes is a very useful way of helping you remember things right yes and so for a gm you've, you're giving them the book but if the gm isn't going to mm. be literally reading the book line by line at the table they're no. going to have to internalize a lot of that so actually mm. maybe that the, what the yeah. GM does is condenses that down into a flowchart, and the process of doing that means that they're internalizing the, the sense of kind of what it's all about right. and can choose to sack that bit off or add a little bit in because well, that's, that's what they're actually going to use. Yeah, that's the important part because as, as a GM, the fun that I have is seeing the unforeseen things, the weird directions that the players go off in and, and dealing with them on the fly. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anything that militates against that. Uh, I wouldn't enjoy. And Righty gets the final comment. I do a bullet point list. 
but yeah, same yeah. basic idea. And yeah. that brings us to the end of our stream. Um, so uh, <laughs> next week, thank you for joining me, fellow rooks. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so no, he doesn't get the last comment because I clicked on seagulls by accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there you have it, exactly. And that's yeah. where the fun happens, where they go off page. Yeah, timelines can be useful. Anyway, next week um, for season three, episode nine, we are being joined for Mike Mason to talk about my life in horror. Well, not mine, because my life is actually quite nice. Um, <laughs> but that <laughs> is the topic for next week. So yeah. until then, thank you all for joining us on a Saturday night. Thank you to my fellow rooks. Thanks, as always, to our um, patrons and our lovely community on discord and we will see you all again next week for another episode of inside the rookery thanks everyone bye, bye.